Welcome to this webinar. My name is Hanna Kusk. I'm a product manager here at HP Products. And uh, with me from Brisbane, Australia, I have uh, Stefan Jensen, who is a very experienced uh, contractor. He's used web quality controls sensors uh, since uh, 2013, and he's by far the most uh, experienced uh, guy in this area. If you have any questions to the technology or to the to the content, you can write it in the chat in your upper right corner. The questions we, we get in here, we try to answer as we go along, uh, or at the end where we have reserved a couple of minutes, or if we don't manage to, to answer all the questions, you will receive a mail later with the with the recording of, of this webinar and uh, answers to the remaining questions. So the um, the content today will be an introduction to wave quality control measurement and how does it uh, the functionality how does it work what can be achieved by replacing superheat with a vapor quality control? I will do these two first points. And then Stefan will talk about experience with uh, vapor quality uh, in cold stores over the last six years. Is it reliable? How does it work? And how long, how low can you get the, the charge when using vapor quality control? And how how low can you get your specific energy consumption for a cold store? That's a special term that uh, Stefan will explain. And in the end, we expect to have a couple of minutes for questions and uh, wrap up. So what can vapor quality control do? It can reduce the, the energy consumption of a of a refrigeration plant or a, or a heat pump. It can operate with a significantly smaller charge and it can also increase the capacity. And how does it work? Um, a wave quality control sensor is in basic a capacitor. And this uh, a capacitor consists of two poles. Uh, and the sensor consists of two poles as well. And what's in between the two poles is what we call the dielectric material. And for a sensor, it's it's the liquid you like to, to detect or the mix of gas and liquid you like to detect. So for, um, for a sensor, we have a, a, an outer tube and we have an inner tube and these are the two poles that we we use in the in the uh, in the sensor. So if we look at um, at a at a real sensor here, we have different types of uh, of sensors, and um, here you see one type which is a straight one. We have the the outer pole which is the outer pipe, and we have the an an inner pipe here which is the inner pole and we detect what flows between these these pipes the hole in the middle is uh, is not so interesting because you will have the gas uh, passing here but the liquid you're concerned about is flowing on on the sides we have different types we also have uh, this type which has an inner pole and an outer pole and it measures what's in here and we have the uh, the one built into uh, in a, into a strainer house, it works as an elbow, um, and you have the inner part and you have the outer pipe. And just to to demonstrate how how it works, if you can see the the amp meter here, uh, you can see it reads four milliamps. And if you apply some some liquid, you can see how it it goes up now from from four to to five point two milliamps so it's it's really effective 
checking what uh, whether liquid is uh, coming into the um, into the center. And uh, what can it do for uh, for an evaporator? If you compare the the wave quality control with uh, with superheat control, we have this um, chart here, which is a part of a research project. You have the cooling capacity up on on the axis here, and you have time on the on the on the y axis. And you can see the the black curve is uh, vapor quality control, and you can see the gray curve is superheat control. And what you can actually see as is that you have higher capacity and a more stable capacity when you when you use uh, vapor quality control, whereas superheat is slower. So it depends on a, on a temperature measurement and that is is actually quite slow so you will have a higher amplitude and you will have a a, a, a lot of variation in cooling capacity um, and evaporation the your your expansion will valve will will open and close rapidly whereas the wave quality control is is more is more stable acts significantly faster And um, here we have a slide from a, a Romanian uh, cold store. It is uh, built as an ammonia system with uh, direct expansion. And um, it, is, it was started up with conventional superheat. And uh, it operated with conventional superheat until the middle of September. And you can see the the power consumption here from from the first of uh, September to approximately the sixteenth of September, and afterwards in from from the nineteenth and onwards they operated it purely with wave quality control, and the the energy consumption was actually reduced by forty three percent. So. Um, it is is really a, a, a huge benefit when shifting from superheat control to vapor quality control, and the reason is is uh, less superheat in your in your output from the evaporator. And now I will pass on to uh, Stefan. Okay, thank you. Let's see if we can make this work. Yep. Right. How does this look? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. So, good morning in Europe. Uh, here it's uh, much later. It's uh, almost seven o'clock at night here in Australia or down under. So, thanks for listening. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe just a question. Uh, whether or not the audience is familiar with what we call specific energy consumption. This is a widely accepted um, metric for determining the uh, energy efficiency or otherwise of a refrigerated warehouse. <clears throat> and it's simply calculated by taking the annual energy consumption of the facility in kilowatt hours and divide that by the refrigerated volume in cubic meters, then we get a number, which is kilowatt hours per cubic meter per year. And that is a measure for specific energy consumption. Uh, technically speaking, it's necessary to use the value for the refrigeration plant on its own, but that's often not available. Uh, so a shortcut is to use the entire electricity bill and then take 10 or 20% off, because usually in a refrigerated warehouse, the electricity consumption of the refrigeration system is more or less 80 or 90% uh, of, of the total. So I'll be talking to you about a few practical examples, mainly business examples. So they'll show what is achievable by using these sensors, in, in other words, by using quality-based injection control. And um, 
some uh, not much theory a little bit in the beginning where we'll be looking at some some graphs and curves for practical installations so uh, here goes for the present situation this is not isolated uh, to australia this is basically the global situation what i've attempted to show here is uh, how big the difference between average practice and best practice can be in reality so you probably can't see what the numbers here say but on the vertical axis out to um, out to the left we have the specific energy consumption in kilowatt hours per cubic meter per year and along the horizontal axis we have refrigerated volume starts at zero and finishes at about 400,000 cubic meters <clears throat> so this is a sizable cold store and uh, the the top curve is drawn through what one might call average practice so these are plants that satisfy what i personally call average practice there's a number of systems there the the, the sec values come out of publications one comes from ashray publication from 2018 and and some other publications both from australia and the us and then there are some of our own plants in there two-stage ammonia liquid overfeed plants they're the yellow ones they're plants that we designed and built for one contractor sorry one customer uh, over a period from 1999 to 2013 and then we look at the lower curve uh, you can see that lower curve that I call best practice goes to a, a cluster of green dots. Now, those green dots represent centralized low charge systems, and almost all of those, with a couple of exceptions, are controlled with the um, HBX sensors. In other words, the injection is controlled by means of, of the quality signal at the evaporator exit. And that uh, neural eight you see in the middle of the picture, this is me attempting to show the difference between one of the worst and one of the best in this picture. And this is not an unusual number. The average number is more like four, and there are numbers as low as 1.5 or something, but that's at the lower end of the scale. Now, we have some more to say about this uh, green star that's called super practice, but just bear with us. Now here's an example that uh, is for one size cold store, like a 100,000 cubic meter volume cold store. And you can see there that um, the difference between average practice, this is the curve I've explained before, and best practice is a uh, 75%. This means a cold store in this case that performs to average practice uh, energy performance uses four times more energy per year than the cold thaw that performs to uh, best practice. So this is uh, significant. Just uh, remember that number and we go to some, some practical uh, examples now. So a cold thaw, 100,000 cubic meter cold thaw without blast freezing in this part of the world uh, has a refrigeration plant that's worth about $3 million, Australian dollars, give or take. And uh, the best practice energy consumption is uh, about 1500 megawatt hours per year and average practice energy consumption is five and a half thousand megawatt hours a year this is just numbers that i take from the previous slide that difference if we are paying uh, an average of 20 cents per kilowatt hour or 200 dollars per megawatt hour that difference in dollars is about eight hundred thousand dollars australian per year so if you divide that $800,000 into the capital cost of 3 million, you get a, a simple payback period of less than four years. In other words, the, the owner of this plant can ask uh, him or herself, is, if I have a, an older plant that uses 5,500 megawatt hours a year, is it worth keeping? So this is an important question. Even if the energy cost is half of $200 per megawatt hour, it is still an important question. Here we have a, another example. You may remember from the previous graph with all the dots, we had uh, one red one right up there. This is actually an existing plant, and the annual operating cost of that existing plant is $380,000 a year. It's a uh, plant with screw compressors, two screw compressors, single stage economized. 
And uh, the same client, not far away, has a plant that is represented by the other yellow circle further down in the picture, and that is about 300 kilometres away. Um, it, it's the same size cold store. It's the same client. They do the same things, and that plant has an operating cost of $115,000 a year. You can see there's a sizable difference between the two. In this case, the client has decided to replace the plant that uses uh, $380,000 a year with one that is identical to the one in the other yellow circle that uses $115,000 a year. And that will give a payback of less than five years. And um, this is interesting because this is basically not quite the difference represented by going to HBX type control. There is another complication in there, and that is, um, of course, that one plant is a single stage plant with screw compressors, the other plant is a two stage plant with reciprocating compressors on speed control. That has an impact as well. Now, this is another example. This is an existing uh, 404A based installation, a very small plant. When the modification first started, this plant had a refrigerated volume of about 3,500 cubic metres or so. And um, this was converted to a uh, centralised low charge ammonia system. You can see a picture of here. Same concept as I explained before, two stage uh, uh, dry expansion system with HBX control. And um, the ammonia inventory in this case is 250 kilos. There was an expansion of the facility at the same time from about 3,500 to about 5,250 cubic metres, uh, or about 40%. Yet the um, monthly electricity costs fell by about $10,000. So these are the numbers, the hard numbers. The SEC reduction was from uh, 206 to 68 kilowatt hours per cubic metre per year, or two thirds. And the reduction in electricity, as I said before, $10,000 a month. The interesting part here is that that saving in electricity is enough to uh, pay the instalments on a 10 year commercial loan at 5% per annum to fund the purchase of the new plant. This, in simple terms, means that the cash, the, the plant is cash flow, the new plant is cash flow positive from day one. There will be there will be a cost reduction from day one. Stefan, we have a uh, Stefan, we have a question here. Uh, how large uh, cold store can you build based with with uh, one and a half tons of ammonia? If I had to have a guess at it, uh, it would be a pro rata guess. Uh, currently, we are building one that is 250,000 cubic metres, and that has an inventory of 900 uh, kilos or thereabouts, 900 to 950. So I would say uh, we would be able to build uh, one that is around 400,000, 500,000 cubic metres of refrigerated volume with an inventory of one and a half tonnes. Of, of ammonia. That, that's for a cold store without blast freezing. Thank you. You're good. So just move on to the next slide. This this is a, a, an interesting one because uh, this is probably the first time ever that anyone's been able to do this kind of comparison. I'll just explain what it means. On the vertical axis, we have specific energy consumption of the refrigerated facility and on the horizontal axis, we have volume. So the 22 number uh, is an older cold store we did for a client about 10 years ago. And uh, it's conceptually identical to the new plant we did for the same client. that has a volume of 44,000. This is the blue uh, cross you can see there. And the two plants are conceptually identical. Both use four reciprocating compressors with speed control. The older plant is liquid overfeed. The new plant is dry expansion. So the difference between the old and the new is that we have eliminated the presence of heavier liquid in the entire suction line network of the new plant. And the effect of that is, as you can see there, the older plant 
uses 1.4 times best practice as specific energy consumption. The new plant is 0.97 times best practice. Now these numbers are recorded over almost a year. In the case of the Blue Cross, it's almost a year. So this is the penalty that is being paid by contaminating the suction line network of an industrial plant with high density liquid that is anything up to a thousand times heavier than the vapor at a, at a temperature minus 33. So this is uh, some, these are some slides of the new plant, the one that uses 0.97 times best practice. Not terribly important here. You see the, the bottom right hand corner, you see the compressors in the top right hand corner, you see a valve station. Bottom left hand corner, you see the SCADA system. This is where uh, I got the numbers from, the uh, kilowatt hour consumption numbers. The SCADA system is fitted with uh, energy meters. So we can double check what, that the, what the client is paying the utility is in fact real. So this is uh, the fourth uh, example. Now this is uh, another confusing graph, but in principle, it's the same as the ones you've seen before. On the vertical axis, we have the SEC, horizontal axis, we have volume. All these red dots, they come from one major cold storage chain in uh, the US. Uh, and you have, as you can see there, all kinds of concepts. There's con transcritical CO2, two-stage ammonia with liquid overfeed, there's ammonia DX, uh, all kinds of concepts. They are simply as marked on the picture. Those of you who get the presentation later, you'll be able to see what the, what the little boxes say. Now, the green star is the super practice plant I mentioned uh, at the introduction. And it is uh, in the bottom left-hand corner there uh, on its own, very much on its own. So this is quite a staggering result. Now, I do admit uh, this chap uh, that has this good plant that performs 40 odd percent lower than best practice, he's an owner operator. He's very good at closing his doors and he's very good at managing the cold store, but that's not the entire secret. The next slide I'll show you the, the picture. There's nothing terribly unusual about this way, the way this cold, cold store is constructed. The guy put a 27,000 cubic metre uh, insulated panel box inside an existing warehouse, which you can see there on the left. And on the right hand side, you see the pre packaged engine room. This, this comes in a, a pre packaged, as you see it there, without the condenser on top. The condenser is installed after the box is it. It sits in the car park on a couple of concrete pads. Again, it's a uh, DX plant, four compressors, too low, too high, same as all the other ones I discussed before. And the final real life example is, um, is this one here. This is a guy who consolidated three HFC based uh, warehouses into one and he expanded it quite significantly at the same time. So he cut his, um, he got some interesting things, details here that insulated air coolers, there are no evaporators inside the refrigerated warehouse and it's got cold lake uh, air distribution, etc. This This chap reduced his uh, annual electricity bill from uh, 900,000 to 500,000 a year. I, I say 500,000 a year, a year there, because that was the first electricity bill. The second electricity bill indicates that he will now get down to something like $350,000 a year. So this is a very significant reduction of about five, $600,000. The volume is 60,000 cubic meters and the ammonia inventory, this is measured is 472 kilograms. As I said before, the, the place has ambient air defrost. There are no evaporators whatsoever inside the refrigerated warehouse or maintenance and what have you happens uh, outside in the ceiling space above the ante room. And so just uh, some, some very important questions that need to be asked but are not often asked. Uh, Design for best practice energy performance is frankly in the best interest of all stakeholders. It's the best interest of developers, the cold store operators, contractors, you name it. Everyone 
should have that goal, but we don't do it. Why is it not common practice? So this is a question I'll let, let hang there. And what is the capital cost uh, difference between best practice and average practice? In all the plants I've been talking to you about here, it is maximum 15%. Sometimes it's zero, depends on the number of the evaporators, but it is maximum 15%. That 15% can, can quite often give a, a simple payback period of less than one year. And operators cold store should ask themselves the question, what proportion of the total life cycle costs is the capital cost of the engine room, the capital cost of the refrigeration system? How much of the total life cycle cost does that represent? And there are some uh, very bad examples where that percentage is under 10%. It's down as low as 6 or 7%. Yet many buying decisions are based on capital cost and not life cycle cost. And finally, the point I would like to make is that in my long experience in this business, it is uh, nine times out of 10 in my part of the world anyway, it is the entity that understands the least about refrigeration technologies that gets to make the decision about what technologies are applied in a certain application. This just seems illogical, but this is what happens more, more often than not. So thanks a lot for listening. Now we have some questions. Uh, I, I can I can start with. Uh, with um, I can, You're I can the moderator, with, uh, Henry. So I suggest you moderate. Thank you. <laughs> sure. I say the the first question, uh, first part of the, of the uh, question from Gabor is um, whether uh, we have experience with other uh, refrigerants than ammonia. We we sell the the. Um, the devices for for CO two for for different synthetic uh, refrigerants. Uh, people are trying it with propane and butane as well. So uh, yes, it's possible to to use it for for other uh, refrigerants. The only thing you should uh, consider is how much oil you have together with your refrigerant because it's measured together with the liquid refrigerant. Um, and to uh, to you, uh, Stefan, what uh, what kind of expansion device uh, uh, evaporators uh, is preferred for for these applications? It depends on the operating temperature. So for low temperature evaporators, we have uh, bad experiences with pulse timing devices. So these are, I'm sure, you're familiar with pulse timing devices. I mean, in a seven second cycle, it might be open for three seconds and then shut for four seconds. But those kinds of devices, they work for medium temperature, minus five, minus 10 evaporating temperature. They don't work so well for lower temperatures. For lower temperatures, we use uh, motorized expansion valves, so modulating motorized expansion valves, and we drive those directly from the central PLC on the basis of the uh, quality signal that we get from from the evaporators in the field. And what about the evaporators themselves? Uh, are some better than others? Well, there's no doubt about that. The key, the key to a, a successful uh, centralized low charge ammonia system is to get the evaporator design correct in the first place. Uh, I've been doing this for a very long time and I have been burnt more times than most people, I think, by using incorrect evaporators that did not work. Now, there's, uh, there was some new knowledge that came about in 2008 at the Gustav Lanson conference in Copenhagen where a young lad by the name Dermot Cotter, not young anymore, he still works in the same place, he managed to record uh, the behavior of boiling refrigerants inside the pipe as a function of the thermal conductivity of the tubes used in the evaporator. This was a bit of a breakthrough. The following year, Piga Erniak from uh, Illinois uh, did some similar presentations in America. And what is interesting there is that um, the lower the thermal conductivity of the core pipe is, the greater the tendency of the refrigerant to form a creek in the bottom of the pipe. 
and and fail to expose the inside surfaces of the, of the tube used in the evaporator. This is important information. This is not only evaporator performance is not only a function of turbulence, it is a function of being able to draw the boiling refrigerant up along the internal surfaces of the pipe to make it expose all surfaces of the pipe. And that that improves with increasing thermal conductivity of the core tube used in the evaporator. So this is very important. And uh, and another uh, important thing is to install the uh, wave quality sensor directly after the evaporator. Uh, we have seen uh, customers installing them on the top of a riser. And uh, what happens is that you collect a lot of liquid in, in the riser and uh, until until you have filled the the riser with liquid uh, the valve will be open and the evaporator will be drowned in uh, in refrigerant so the the sensor need to be installed just after the the evaporator that's important that is uh, very true i i inspected a plant not long ago where where i observed exactly this problem not one of ours, but uh, it was uh, an attempt at, at, a, at a dry expansion plant, and exactly the problem you described yeah. was was visible. Very good. I think we are we're done. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to to write a mail. You are welcome to search our web page for for more information. It's not easy to find, but you can find it. So uh, thanks for now and thanks for joining Stefan and thanks for joining everybody. Thank you. Fine. All bye, -bye. The best. See ya. Yeah. Bye.